Okay. So uh, at the outset, uh, uh, first let me thank the Jaipur uh, Surgical Society and especially Dr. Kapoor for this opportunity. It's really an honor and pleasure for me to sort of uh, share this platform with my uh, beloved fr uh, friends from Sanjay Gandhi. Uh, the topic given to me is uh, complications of LDNT. LDNT. It's a very vast topic, obviously, because uh, next slide, please. Yeah. It's a, it's a very vast topic because LDLD being a, an extremely uh, complex uh, surgery. So you don't have just the uh, traditional complications which can occur in many any major surgery such as bleeding, cardiorespiratory problems, renal and electrolyte disturbances. You have a lot of uh, uh, LDLD specific, uh, liver transplant specific and LDLD specific problems which can occur post transplant. So in this 15 minutes, I'll just try to give you a very brief overview and also I'll be touching upon mainly the Complications in the early post-operative period, uh, the, not the late complications. Early means we generally refer to the first three months after surgery. Next slide. So uh, the uh, hepatic artery thrombosis is one of the most dreaded and severe complications after LDLT. Uh, and it's a leading cause of morbidity and mortality. The reported incidence is between 2.5 to 9% uh, 9 worldwide literature, but generally an acceptable rate would be somewhere between uh, 3 to 5% uh, uh, is the accepted uh, rate. There's a lot of data and a lot of publications about what are the risk factors for uh, what are the risk factors for uh, uh, hepatic artery thrombosis following uh, liver transplant. But uh, these are some of the most common in the various publications. See, in, uh, looking at the cadaveric donors, Elderly donors and a prolonged cold ischemia time are important factors. Smokers, across ABO incompatibility transfers, you have higher incidence of arterial and biliary problems. Surgical factors, especially when there's a large size discrepancy between the uh, donor and the recipient vessels, when there's intimal dissection and multiple revisions at surgery have been made. And like I said, pediatric transplant because of the smaller caliber of the vessels, the incidence of hepatic artery thrombosis is more. And a lot of blood product usage, severe hypotension post-surgery, and sometimes like when you have severe ischemia reperfusion injury or uh, severe rejection, that means basically there's so much of graft edema that there's so much of uh, inflow resistance. So that can precipitate uh, hepatic artery thrombosis. So likewise, uh, on the contrary, the, there's no level one data, but uh, there are studies which show that basically microvascular techniques, non-comparative studies with, in centers using the, uh, doing the anastomosis through the operative microscope, you might have lesser incidence of hepatic artery thrombosis. And as the center's volume goes up, definitely the rates have decreased. So uh, the hepatic artery thrombosis based on the duration is classified into early as well uh, and late. I'll, in the early also, let's break it into two groups uh, very early within the first two weeks and after two weeks. Basically, how this presentation differs is as time progresses post-transplant, some degree of collateral is developed around the, especially around the bile duct. And so the severity is a bit muted and it's, it's indolent. So in the first two weeks, let's see, first two weeks, basically, uh, you know, the patient is most of the time in, in hospital and he's getting a Doppler done every day. So many times it's picked up in the, during the, uh, when the patient uh, uh, has a bit of transaminitis immediately as a part of the protocol or as a part of the daily uh, Doppler, we get the Doppler done and uh, it, it picks up hepatic artery thrombosis on the Doppler. But, uh, you know, if uh, the presentation is so fulminant, if it's missed in the morning, by evening, the patient will have a severe uh, transmenitis, enzymes going into thousands, lactate shooting up to 8, 10, and uh, fever, hypertension, SITS, and there's a rapid iteration. So the first within the first two weeks, hepatic artery thrombosis is very fulminant. I mean, compared to the normal liver in, in us, there is some degree of collateral for the phrenic and the left gastric, uh, left phrenic side, but in the uh, transplanted graft, obviously, there's no alternate route to arterial supply, so it's a very fulminant presentation. But the same thing after two weeks. So in the uh, after two weeks, it's a bit less severe. That means if the hepatic artery thrombosis occurs, the LFTs will not so drastically get altered. There'll be mild derangements, mild cholestasis. The lactates also don't shoot up so drastically. It's a bit more indolent course, but still as severe. So it's a, it's a bit more slow course, but still as deadly because what happens is the bile ducts, the predominant blood supply of the bile ducts is arterial. So this bile duct ischemia, it starts with anastomotic leaks, intrahepatic bile duct necrosis, multiple intrahepatic abscesses, which goes on to sepsis and graft failure. So unless an intervention is done immediately and we sort out the problem, the first two, two uh, weeks, uh, we sort out the problem, we go for a transplant. The first two weeks is almost near mortality. The another presentation is late presentation. So as, as, as time goes, move, move on from transplant, the collateral is developed at late presentation. After four weeks, it's a relatively indolent course. So 
patient uh, will have some degree of collaterals, the LFTs and the lactates. We may not get very sick, but over a period of time, biliary issues develop, like mostly non-anastomotic strictures, which is a good sign of arterial ischemia, not just at the anastomosis, but long segmented segmental intrahepatic strictures. Then patients present with recurrent cholangitis and also chronic rejection. Basically, chronic rejection is because the patient is having recurrent septic issues. He's on very low immunosuppression in his post-operative period. And this leads to a chronic rejection. Next slide, please. So the diagnosis is by Doppler. I mean, Doppler is obviously the basic screening test, but Doppler is not can sometimes be uh, false negative. That is, for example, if the patient is on multiple inotropes, there's an arterial spasm, or if there's severe graft edema, the Doppler can be false negative. So the contrast enhanced ultrasound using nanobubbles, that's now available widely in India also. Uh, we, it is a better bedside screening tool than Doppler uh, to screen for artery if, if you have a doubt. But once you have any such doubt, it's immediately, I mean, this is obviously a dire emergency. The patient is Im immediately taken for a CT angio and the uh, CT angio is very sensitive and specific for arterial thrombosis. So angiogram uh, is not, uh, unless you're planning an intervention of some sort of a stenting or a thrombolysis, you would not routinely uh, do the angiogram, the CT angio suffices. So once you have a thrombosis, it's, it requires an uh, immediate reintervention. So within the first week, the in reintervention has to be almost always surgical because you can't just thrombolysis a lot of raw areas and venous wounds, so the patient can have a massive uh, bleed after thrombolysis. So we go in to revascularize, either we redo the anastomosis, if the distal uh, artery is very unhealthy and dissected, there's nothing much we can do, but if the proximal artery is very unhealthy and dissected, we can use an alternative like a conduit uh, can be used uh, if you have a cadaver, an iliac vessel or a PTFE graft, conduit from the aorta can be used. After the first week, 10 days, endovascular re revascularization is fairly successful. In series which have uh, done this, about 60 to 70 percent, they've been able to maintain the patency. Basically, endovascular, you go in, you do a thrombolysis, do an angioplasty and put in a stent most of the time. But in case in, in the early post-op or the late post-op, if you're too late to intervene or we're not able to re-establish the circulation or the patient has got very sick because the liver is already infected, the only option is a retransplant. So this is a very serious complication. The mortality is up to one third. One out of three patients with hepatic artery thrombosis dies. I am sure, I think it's more in the Indian scenario, at least in our setup and elsewhere also, because most of the time in the West, whenever, whenever you have a hepatic artery thrombosis, you have a super agent listing option. So immediately the patient will be in the nationwide database. He'll get the next liver that comes and is very likely to get a liver in the next 48, 72 hours. In the living donor scenario, that's not much of an option. Super agent listing is also very rarely succeeds. So mortality is higher in the Indian scenario. So basically in, in our setup, the prevention is the best way. The meticulous technique, choosing your, um, you know, the vessels, uh, the healthy vessels, make sure that there's no intimal dissection. If dissection, repair it preferably a microvascular anastomosis. Mm, though there's not much of evidence in the high-risk anastomosis, we routinely use an alprostadil infusion, low molecular weight heparin, ecosprin are, are, are also routinely used to prevent thrombosis and aggressive imaging is done. Next slide, please. Yeah, another complication, this is uh, less common than hepatic artery thrombosis, definitely. Hepatic artery stenosis. I mean, the literature says high percentage, but we do see it much less common, and it generally doesn't occur in the first, you know, first few days. It's usually after the first week. Uh, basically, what happens is in your Dopplers, uh, you can see here the normal arterial upstroke. It's like a really sharp upstroke, very fast spike from the basal to the high, highest peak systolic velocity. This becomes flatter, so that's called Tardis Powers phenomenon. That is, the systolic acceleration time is prolonged, and the resistance RI is low. So this indicates and across the uh, proximal to the anastomosis in the hepatic artery, uh, in the uh, recipient hepatic artery, proximal to the anastomosis, there is high flow. So by these things, we identify that patient has a tardus powers. So immediately this has to be taken up in angiography. So if the uh, hepatic artery stenosis is less than 50% and the patient is doing okay, you can just wait and watch. But if it's more than 50, moderate, more, more than 50%, severe, more than 75%, in these cases, it's always better to intervene and put, uh, do an angioplasty. Generally, angioplasty, like I said, it is done within after the first 10 days because uh, thrombolysis is less dangerous. And then the, in, the, in the early part, if you put in a stent, there's always a risk of rupturing the anastomosis. Other rare complications are 
hepatic artery pseudoaneurysm i mean this is a very rare complication but uh, any high volume center would have definitely seen it a couple of times so this is basically a combination of some problem with the artery with local sepsis so that local sepsis could be a local bile leak systemic sepsis or many times fungemia then this can uh, have a present like a uh, it can present like hemophilia if it's intrahepatic it can present like gi bleed or intraabdominal bleed the treatment remains the same within the first week it's exploration and later on it is uh, stenting uh, another uh, uh, unusual complication we've seen a couple of cases is basically in the post op your uh, radiologist says that there is some degree of liver dysfunction your radiologist says the diastolic flow this part of the curve is very flat it's almost on the floor so diastolic flow is very poor then when you do an angio you see that there actually there's no narrowing in your anastomosis but because the splenic artery or sometimes a gda they are very large caliber so they're doing a steel there's a steel phenomenon so in that case you sort of go in and embolize them and it improves next slide please the next complication uh, specific to the uh, uh, sir can we make it a full screen is it possible the next complication which is very specific to the uh, living donor scenario is manshi can you make it a slide show next uh, it's the which is very specific to the ldlt is the neo neo mhv thrombosis i think obviously it's been discussed uh, just now so in the uh, right lobe graft most of the time for donor safety we don't take the mhv with the graft and the segment 5 vein and the segment 8 vein are implanted into the either a, a native uh, uh, portal vein or a vein graft cadaveric vein graft or a ptfe graft so this new mhv can thrombose and it is a fairly common problem it's uh, in uh, in the uh, in three month follow up up to one third of them and in fact maybe in more of them more patients if we because if patient is doing well we don't routinely do ct and all that so the that's uh, uh, this new mhv thrombosis can occur so in the early post this presentation of the new mhv thrombosis is highly variable so it depends on like i think it is being discussed just now how dominant is the middle hepatic vein versus the right hepatic vein so if i have a dominant right hepatic vein with good collateralization you will have minimal symptoms or you can have some patients can have subtle derangement of lfts in which we evaluate and find this or they can have a dramatic picture like a dramatic picture like suddenly one day that bilirubin doubles and the enzymes double and you are thinking it's some uh, rejection or septic hit or arterial thrombosis so it can so depending on how dominant the rhg versus mhv circulation is uh, and how good the collateralization is it can be a fairly um, large so then it becomes a small for size graft basically small for size because one is because the liver is congested and infarcted and uh, there is uh, the effective volume of the liver comes down and also there is a relative portal hyperperfusion that is the inflow to outflow balance is lost because of this it, uh, patient behaves like a small for size Uh, uh, graft dysfunction increased ascites not doing well bile cholestasis enzyme derangements and prone to sepsis so uh, th this is i think uh, an indian uh, publication i think from dr subhash gupta's group they showed in their short term morbidity versus mortality uh, i mean morbidity this is morbidity in the patients who had neo hv thrombosis was 50% compared to 20% in the non neo uh, non thrombosis group so it's a very important and significant co uh, complication by late neo mhv thrombosis especially if the uh, mhv is not dominant is fairly well tolerated neo mhv thrombosis again by a doppler but doppler can make many times miss it because it has to be done by a radiologist who is really good at regularly doing living donor dopplers because the rhv and the portal vein artery are also fairly easy to find but uh, it, this for this the radiologist needs to be experienced and uh, uh, contrast analysis ultrasound is there but whenever you have any such doubt Uh, any lft derangement any uh, suspicion as a protocol we get a, a two phase ct and in that you pick it up so lhv and rhv thrombosis in living donor transplant is very rare uh, this can be unlike some uh, really gross issues like the big twist in the graft occurs if not it's very rare what is more common is uh, stenosis uh, basically this sort of presents late after the first couple of weeks uh, a patient presenting with graft dysfunction and ascites uh, madam you've actually sort of enlarged the screen just make it a normal size some slide part of the slide is gone it's okay if, uh, just keep it in the presentation mode yeah that's fine that's it thank you madam uh, so basically you see this the normally the uh, hepatic vein flow is triphasic there are two negative waves one positive wave two negative waves one positive wave so the radiologist says that is monophasic wave form is not always worrisome 
just monophasic, you don't need to immediately panic. But if clinically the ascites, cholestasis, patient not settling with a monophasic fold on and a high gradient flow across the uh, across the anastomosis there on Doppler, then these patients, uh, we need to do a CT angio, document the narrowing and treatment remains, uh, uh, you know, hepatic venous pressure gradient is measured and uh, angioplasty with a hepatic vein stenting is done, following which the patients usually respond very well. Next slide, please. Portal vein thrombosis is uh, the next vascular complication. It's a relatively in the adult living donor scenario, portal vein thrombosis is a rare complication. It's more common in pediatric because most of the time in pediatric, you have the portal vein is attenuated and you need a more complex uh, reconstruction, like putting a PDFE or a venous graft from the SMV uh, splenic vein junction. And in patients with split liver transplantation, patients with a preoperative thrombosis, in adults with a patient with a pre-existing thrombus where you've done a thrombectomy, when there's complex reconstruction like two portal veins or a a uh, long segment graft we input. These are the patients where it occurs. When it does occur in the early postoperative, it's again a pretty serious complication. When the early portal vein thrombus occurs, there's massive ascites, severe abdominal pain related to bowel congestion, liver dysfunction, bowel edema, and uh, uh, portal evidence of bleed. So uh, the diagnosis is fairly simple. It's immediately diagnosed by Doppler and confirmed on CT scan. Uh, like for artery, the if it happens within the first a uh, few uh, first week within the first week after transplant the only option is re-exploration redo the portal vein and then put them on anticoagulation uh, therapeutic anticoagulation while if it happens a week after surgery a week 10 days after surgery you can try thrombolytic therapy and anticoagulation but uh, again in in both arterial or portal venous thrombosis if it doesn't succeed the option is only re retransplantation the same thing when the portal vein thrombosis occurs late so this is mostly you know when the patient is on opd follow-up it doesn't really affect the immediate outcomes much, only it leads to portal hypertension. Portal hypertension is uh, treated medically and uh, if uh, preferably tips to reduce the portal evidence of complications. Next slide, please. So the biliary complications are the ecclesial of liver transplantation. So uh, the incidence of biliary complications in LDLT is high, uh, as high as uh, 10 to 30 percent. The late onset, onset strictures needing intervention between one to five years are 20 percent. So Probably one out of five, five of your LDLT patients is going to need a uh, have a biliary stricture and need an intervention. I feel, in fact, the percentage is bit probably bit more in our country. The reason why I say is in West they have like this uh, they have the cadaveric option, so they accept type one and type two anatomy. But in the UK, at least in my time, type three, which is a very challenging, especially when this gap between these two ducts is more the right anterior right posterior is more or type three uh, B anatomy. These kind of anatomies they would not accept because. They have the living donor uh, cadaveric option. Well, in India, we, we don't really have much of a choice. We accept all the biliary anatomies. So complications are obviously because of these variations more in the right lobe graphs. Left lobe graphs, there's not much of variation. They showed that the cutoff, this is large publications are there from Korea. The duct size less than four millimeters, the high, it's higher incidence of stricture. There's fairly good data to show that a hepatic jejunostomy is superior to a duct to duct anastomosis in avoiding biliary strictures. But, you know, most of the time, uh, because hepatic genesis in, involves opening a rule limb and then an another anastomosis plus a duct to duct, you always have an option of uh, doing a, it's simpler to do it. And it, there's also the, yeah. Yes, yes. Up, up, madam. I think funny, uh, I will interrupt. Uh, maybe we can uh, leave the cellular, the rejection part and have okay. some discussion on the technical. So till what time do we go? Do you have anything else uh, other than rejection? That's it, sir. Basically, bit, uh, I mean, I the slides, uh, maybe just the other complications, like these are the biliary, com maybe I can just complete the biliary and we just uh, rest. Yes. We can list yeah, I think we can stick on with only technical complications. Yes, yes. yes, yes. Go on, madam. Yeah. No, you want to, uh, funny, you want to add anything other than rejection? Uh, the biliary, let me complete that, sir. Technical yes, yes, yes. Then we can uh, wind up. I mean, rest. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Madam, can you go up previous slide? Go to the previous slide, please, Himanshi. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the HJ is superior to duct to duct, and uh, then uh, hepatic artery issues and ABO incompatibility. These patients also have biliary complications. So, uh, the biliary complications are mainly leaks and uh, strictures. Obviously, early post op is more of leaks. The bioma presentation is not like in your regular uh, post operative patients, not always with pain and fever. They may have more subtle presentation, like yes. just yes. with, yes. with cholesterol yes. and graft yes. dysfunction. And uh, uh, so uh, then we evaluate and find it on the CT or the MRCP. 
some centers in the early if early by leagues they re-explore and do a revision hepatic angiogenesis but uh, you know most of the time we we are like less aggressive with these because you go in and revising also it's all very friable uh, so the the interventions is usually in terms of a ERCP or a, a, a PCD then likewise strictures they occur late i mean uh, again the problem with you, you can have lft derangements cholangitis abscess but uh, strictures also sometimes it's very difficult to diagnose because unlike the regular livers or in the normal liver non transplant liver or a cadaveric liver you don't see much of uh, intrahepatic biliary radical dilatation only there is no dilatation or minimal dilatation there is loss of signal only at the anastomosis sometimes you have bile duct cast so it's very difficult to make the decision so sometimes it's a combination of clinical acumen do a biopsy also rule out rejection and then go in for the biliary intervention so sometimes the decision making is difficult in ldld so when you have strictures you have to differentiate between anastomotic and non anastomotic strictures uh, basically anastomotic strictures are usually so short segment mostly related to technical factors while non anastomotic strictures are going to be uh, hepatic artery related they are going to be difficult to manage and most of the time patient may need to be relisted so uh, the treatment is mainly uh, by, again by ercp is the preferred route but many of these patients because of the right lobe graft uh, there is a lot of uh, difficulty in the, with the angles and all that or one particular segment you are trying to enter so then you might have to do a rendezvous mm -hmm. and if you are not able to get across option is a surgical revision again surgical revision in a cadaver is uh, very easy relatively easy because it's just going to uh, go above and open the left duct like a hepquinard approach while in living donor it's very tough uh, option okay. i think uh, this completes the technical uh, issues sir so uh, Mari, maybe you can start the discussion yeah funny really fantastic uh, uh, presentation on the uh, post operative complications um, couple of things uh, i wanted to add myself after that uh, let's take the questions we talked very well about the hepatic artery thrombosis but uh, you uh, mentioned uh, splenic artery thrombosis as a pa passing remark only uh, in my opinion the hepatic artery especially in the living donor setting is uh, you know is so small and it's so unforgiving either it runs or it doesn't run if there is a technical issue it just doesn't run beyond a few hours or beyond the theater itself mm. so what happens uh, in my own understanding is if it happens if the hepatic artery thrombosis happens after a couple of days or a couple of one or two weeks i guess we the uh, important factor is a portal hyperperfusion because there is a sub um, you know, suboptimal anastomosis there and which is superimposed on a portal hyperperfusion then probably the hepatic artery thrombosis happens if it's a pure technical uh, issue i guess it happens on table or by the time within the first 24 hours so uh, what is portal hyperperfusion uh, funny you would you like to uh, explain in little bit detail for the sake of pgs portal hyperperfusion and how uh, yeah. hepatic artery buffer so basically i mean uh, the thing is uh, the when you once you do the portal vein anastomosis uh, well, there's two things one is that the uh, you only for half the liver you are giving uh, the full liver's portal uh, inflow is coming up so there many times it's been uh, the accepted uh, level of uh, portal flow is sort of like 100 ml per uh, per gram per minute for, for, that is the sort of flow about double the uh, portal flow of the normal liver is accepted but when there is portal hyperperfusion so that's like more than two times or real severe is more than four times the flow uh, that leads to basically a, a, a shear injury and uh, liver dysfunction what we call a small per size and also there's some degree of relative congestion of the liver because there's a relative functional outflow obstruction we call it because the inflow is too much and outflow is not able to match this is the voice i am when i saw him first time ha first time I can hear a lot of other voices. Yeah, others. Can you kindly unmute? Sorry, mute yourself. Yeah. So yeah. basically, now uh, in once we do the uh, transplant and uh, we assess the portal flow, there, there's the concept of splenic artery modulation has come in uh, to like uh, uh, splenic artery splenic artery ligation. I mean, splenic artery ligation to sort of uh, reduce the portal flow. But normally, we do what we do is at the end of the surgery. Uh, especially if it's a uh, you know borderline small small size graft or we are an outflow or something what we would do is measure the portal pressure if the portal pressure is more than 15 or if the flow is uh, uh, more than twice the regular uh, the normal flow uh, then we would do a, a portal uh, modulation so uh, portal vein flow modulation by doing a splenic artery ligation so this is good to uh, prevent not just the uh, uh, portal hyperperfusion related injury but also like relative liver congestion uh, in the post op which may predispose you to to arterial thrombosis as well 
I hope that was your question there. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. hepatic artery buffer. So uh, for the sake of the postgraduates are there. So the portal flow and the hepatic artery flow are inversely uh, related to each other. So the portal flow is more, the hepatic artery flow is going to be less and vice versa. Not always vice versa, but when the portal flow is high, the hepatic artery flow will be reduced. So when there is a very high portal flow, the hepatic artery goes into sort of a spasm. And when the uh, when there is already a suboptimal anastomosis there, it thrombosis off. So that is one thing uh, which uh, I guess uh, uh, people have to uh, understand. Very quickly, if you can take the questions in the chat. Sure, sir. Uh, we'll finish in another three, four minutes. Yeah. Why no hyperperfusion in donor ever? So, yeah, there is there is hyperperfusion injury in the donor also. That's why when you have a, that is the mechanism of when you have a small, small remnant, uh, they, 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 they can have persistent uh, high ascites. In the bilirubin may take time and occasionally you see liver failure. So yes. the bioperfusion injury occurs in donor also, but in the recipient, obviously the, the metabolic load on the liver is more and there's other factors like ischemia, reperfusion injury and uh, all these like Pari was saying, there's relative outflow obstruction because the inflow is more and outflow is not so much. So then congestion and all these problems can occur. Yes. So one more question from me, which you can answer for the sake of the younger audience. Why do we need to do uh, Dopplers twice a day? So, so basically, the, uh, there's a golden uh, window. I mean, in the hepatic artery thrombosis, once you have a uh, hepatic artery thrombosis, the in the like like I said, unlike the normal liver, when the hepatic artery goes, there is some degree of collaterals from the phrenic and all those collaterals. So liver survives for some time, but in the hepatic uh, in the transplanted liver, there is no other collateral. And as you know, fifty percent of the oxygen is from the liver, and the predominant biliary supply is from the liver. So there's a very uh, small window. Before by which in which you can before the patient LFT gets badly damaged or the liver starts infarcting, you should identify and sort of treat this problem. So to to identify the patient in that window, especially the high risk anastomosis, we should uh, frequently keep doing Dopplers because once the uh, uh, that golden window passes and there's an enzyme rise and the liver infarct starts, even a reintervention may be uh, useless. Yeah, can I put it this way? So you have to catch it before actually it shows up on the LFT. So that is the reason why we got to do the Dopplers very, uh, very frequently. If it's already showing up on LFT, it means that it's uh, it's little too late. Uh, and uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, yeah, there not, are two or three more questions. Quickly, yeah. please, Pani. It has please. the me method of biliary reconstruction in relation to the stricture rate and regards to the posterior intermediate with not inside or not uh, outside continuous running suture. Uh, basically, the me method of biliary reconstruction, uh, there is good data showing that the hepaticojejunostomy uh, is the preferred uh, 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 anastomosis compared to the uh, uh, duct to duct, especially when when you have the type three A anatomy, which we, which is at least in one out of five patients we see the type three A anatomy with the gap between the ducts is very far away, and many of the times the duct alone cannot reach both these ducts, and we end up doing a suboptimal bile duct anastomosis, and they're very small anastomosis. So there's literature showing that the hepatic anastomy is much better, but Obviously, there's a bit reluctance on the evidence part to go for that because uh, it, in, it involves opening bowel during surgery, doing another anastomosis and uh, the uh, post-op re-intervention also, the stricture, the uh, intervention, the, uh, the radiologist, obviously in the first couple of uh, weeks, first two, three weeks after surgery, liver is very soft and you can't do a PTBD. So you're stuck then. So while if you do a duct to duct, you have a uh, still an ERCP is a chance. So uh, basically, what I meant was the HJ is uh, preferred, especially when you have two ducts. I think there's good data. No, I guess funny, the question was whether you'll have the knots inside or outside. No, no, method of biliary reconstruction in relation to stricture rate. Yeah. So the knots inside or outside, the gen uh, the, usually the posterior we do continuous because most of the time the suture used is in living donor is 6 OPDS. And when you have PDS is a stiff knot, it stays in for six months. And you don't want to have, and we lead a, leave five, five to six throws on that. So it's going to be a bulky suture. It could be a nidus for a, uh, you know, crystal formation on that and obstruction. So posteriorly, posterior, we do always continuous. Some people try to put the posterior knots behind the bile duct. <coughs> so, but we generally avoid doing a posterior interrupted with the knots inside. So it's posterior continuous anterior interrupted. Right. Next is how to prevent endothelial dissection of hepatic artery during anastomosis. So this is obviously a major problem. 
uh one is uh, both in the donor and even more frequently in the recipient especially in the elderly recipients so one is avoid holding the artery and uh, avoid holding the artery avoid crushing the artery while you uh, when you tie it i mean we uh, we several people have several ways of how to avoid dissection we generally lift it up with a with a loop and then just put clips and not tie it to uh, avoid the circular shear other important thing is when you have uh, uh you know some dissection is occurring immediately put a bulldog just below it because the blood dissects between these two planes and it keeps on dissecting but you know despite all these things you uh, dissection especially in the uh, because donors are usually young fit donors in the recipient side is a frequent problem more important thing is to identify the dissection and uh, make sure that you uh, excise the dissection dissected part go proximally you, and select a very healthy artery to do that many times so i think uh, uh, you know p- p- people use the they go till the gda where the, even if the dissection occurs extensively in the hepatic artery you can use the gda for inflow or you can you, know, you might have to go more proximally but identifying the dissection and if you don't have a choice you have to repair the dissection with fine stitches get the clot out and repair with eight or stitches and then do the anastomosis can i just have to stop yeah we, yeah, fine. we are all yeah. thank you very much funny thank you parish thank you funny uh, thank you very much